start our recording now. And I'm going to welcome everyone. It's uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern time. I uh, was reminded that this weekend, I guess we fall back. So we get an extra hour of sleep on Saturday night. So happy, uh, happy Halloween coming up here, everyone. Hopefully it's a, it's a safe one in many ways. Paul, uh, we'll actually launch your program in just a few moments here. And of course, you, you and I'll be presenting tonight, but rather than do the, the normal formal introduction, and since you're, you're joining us tonight from the comfort of the International Space Station, you know, I must, I must say I'm jealous. Uh, you must have quite a view up there. Of course, you know, here I am stuck in the lab, you know, where I, where I, I live, but that's okay, Paul. If somebody's going to live the big life, it better be you. So what a great place to do your research. <laughs> and uh, I, I hope you're, in, you're enjoying all those frozen meals <laughs> up there in outer space. Well, most definitely, yes. <laughs> well, thank you for that background. As I, I said a little while ago, I think we, we all need a little refresher from the realities of planet Earth right now. But what I would really like you to do is uh, I decided to forego the formal introduction and I would ask you to kind of just give us a few moments of your background. You said a little while ago, you're originally from New York. Please tell us a little bit about your life story. Well, I started uh, my education as a metallurgical engineer in New York University. And I uh, joined a company called Jelenko in uh, 1973. Uh, as a member of their research department, I developed quite a number of alloys for them. And then in uh, 1995, I established my own company. And then a few years later, I joined Oregon. In between there, uh, I got a degree in ceramic engineering from Rutgers University. So I have uh, both the metal side and the ceramic side. Uh, with um, with Argon, I started off developing alloys, and then in uh, when Zirconia was introduced by uh, Den Supply, we got very interested in that, and we started uh, our, our own manufacturing around 2010, and we developed a couple of very interesting products that we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a little later. So I've been involved with the development of both the alloys and the and the ceramics. And um, most recently, as I said, uh, uh, Zirconia, and it's a, a very exciting time. We had a hundred well, years. Me, of... uh, let me make sure I, I heard you correctly. You've been with Arjun for how many years? Oh, since 96. Okay, so you've seen a lot of change over these uh, last 34 years. Yes, most definitely. Uh, Argon itself uh, had to transform itself from a uh, supply company to a digital outsourcing center, as well as uh, providing a, a supply of uh, zirconia products to, to their clients like yourself. And the outsourcing center, we recognized that the digital world was, uh, was coming upon the dental industry very early. Uh, we uh, established a, a, a digital center in 2000, we have, well, we established a digital center internally in 2007 with uh, uh, 3D printing of metal and uh, I was responsible for developing alloys for that particular application. And we continue to do so. Uh, most recently, we introduced a new alloy uh, back in just uh, last year. And that's been very successful. Uh, so with, uh, uh, with that outsourcing center, we got very involved with uh, uh, all of digital dentistry. And we, uh, we print models. Uh, we do the milling of zirconia. Uh, we do custom abutments, um, anything digital. Uh, we're we're involved in it. So well, the, Paul, I want to I want to thank you for making that point because number one, I'm I, I'm sure the the name Arjun is probably pretty well known in dentistry. Uh, but the one of the key points for you is that your company went from being an alloy company to an alloy company and now a zirconia company, and you've done that successfully. At the same time, you've become a very serious partner to the dental lab industry as a manufacturer, as a subcontractor. And I should point out a very high quality sub, uh, subcontractor. We use you, for example, for our, our SLM copings and, and some of our gold crowns and some of our non-OEM abutments. 
So for you, I, I actually, I'm glad that that opportunity has come up for you because I think it's made you a better company uh, in your understanding the realities of, of what laboratories go through day in and day out. Because in essence, you are running a laboratory as well. So uh, on that note, uh, you know, given the depth of experience that you have, uh, I'm, I'm just so pleased and honored uh, to have you with us tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I wanna welcome you uh, to Zirconia Science, what you should know. Uh, Dr. Cascone, uh, Cascone and, and I, Mike Colwick, the owner of Dental Masters, but we're gonna spend the next uh, little bit under an hour now with you uh, addressing the world of zirconia. It's become the, the number one most popular uh, indirect restorative material in dentistry. And it's been around for a little over 10 years now. And there's been a lot that has gotten better there's still certainly some areas that have represent challenges in clinical practice. And according to Dr. Christensen, uh, 2018, then he noted that in a CR report, that seven out of 10 of those surveyed in their universe had experienced some failures, either debonding or fracturing. So we're gonna get a closer look tonight as to how to prevent uh, fractures and, and how to prevent uh, debonding, the, the loss of, of cement adherence to the natural tooth. So with that in mind, I want to underline for you that you are welcome at any time to go into the chat room and uh, make a question. Uh, we won't be able to necessarily respond to all those questions, but as they come up, uh, when I, as Paul is speaking initially, uh, I will pass on information when it's appropriate and he will do the same uh, when it's my turn. So on that note, again, everyone welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here. Paul, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And, and good evening, everyone. So today uh, we're gonna be talking about zirconia science and uh, uh, Michael is gonna be handling the second part of the program with regard to what our objectives are. Number one, we wanna understand the nature of dental zirconia, where it comes from, the science of zirconia, it's something called the Y classification of dental zirconia. And we're going to also talk about the newer dental grades of zirconia because it just keeps increasing. Uh, Michael will then go into uh, learn why zirconia fractures or debonds, the do's and the don'ts uh, from, from, from the operatory perspective, and then learn the best practices for zirconia clinical success. Okay, so let's get started. So first of all, what is zirconia? Uh, zirconia is a ceramic made from the mineral zircon. And zircon formed in the Earth's crust about 4 billion years ago. It was one of the first minerals to form. Uh, it's found all over the, on every continent. And in some cases, right on the beaches. It, it's called zircon sand for, for that reason. And zircon, zircon is actually zirconium silicate with radioactive elements. Now, how does something that was formed three and a half, four billion years ago get distributed uniformly throughout the earth? Well, you're looking at a computer simulation of what we think happened. This was uh, th three and a half to four billion years ago when the earth was still being bombarded by asteroids. Every circle you see is the uh, impact of an asteroid and that portion of the earth has melted. Uh, so the crust of the earth melts and anything that's, that's below the mantle then gets pushed to the surface. The biggest commercial mine for uh, zircon is in the western part of Australia, called the Jacks Hills area. And you're looking at the mine on the left-hand side. It's an open pit mine. The surface, the material is very close to the surface. There's only a small overburden. And you can see there's not much else there. Uh, this area of the, of the globe is actually the uh, most untouched by erosion, wind erosion, and uh, tectonic plates. So there are uh, crystals here and, and uh, uh, in that area where uh, uh, the uh, time uh, when the crystal formed could be brought back to that three and a half to four billion years ago. And, and the reason why is because uh, this is the composition on the left, on the right hand side rather, and the reason why you could determine the time is because it has two radioactive materials, thoria and uranium. And you can see the radioactivity is not incidental. It, it's, it's quite significant. You don't want to put that next to a soft tissue. 
Uh, the material is essentially uh, silica with this uh, uh, zirconia, and we'll talk more about uh, uh, this percentage. But this is what the sand looks like. And now we're going to take that sand and we're going to extract the zirconia from it. This process is a very intense uh, commercial, uh, commercially large uh, chemical process where the sand actually gets dissolved in hydrochloric acid. So it's extremely aggressive and it has to be done in very, very large quantities. A typical batch of zirconia is five metric tons. It's very, very large. Uh, and through this uh, uh, dissolution process in the acid, uh, we eliminate the thoria and the uranium, as well as the silica and the majority of the other elements. Now, we form this soup of zirconium chloride, and now you have a choice. And the processing for dental zirconia begins at this slurry stage. This big oatmeal thing <laughs> will now determine what you want out of it. So in our case, we add the yttria as yttria chloride right at this stage. And the reason why we do it here is because once we get rid of all the water, the yttria becomes an integral part of the zirconium matrix. And that's what we need. We want the yttria to uh, align with the zirconium matrix. The crystallites that are that form the zirconia are all nano size. You see, this is 100 nanometers here. This, this is the crystallites that are in the slurry. Now, as, as I said, you could do a variety of different things with this slurry. You could take this slurry right now and mill it, uh, which, which involves tumbling it with uh, uh, zirconia, and you could get the particle size a little smaller. Now, I'm going to show you in, in, on, on the next series of slides that this is exactly the same composition. These two materials have exactly the same composition, but because we made one change in the, in the, uh, to the process where we milled it, we're going to see a dramatic difference in the optical properties of the material. So let's just continue for now. And we're going to take this material. We're going to uh, spray dry it, which means we get rid of the water. The chlorine get, goes off as a gas, and we wind up with the oxides. And uh, along with that, we add a binder. And when we spray dry it, it comes out all well, these beautiful little spherical particles. And again, they're very small, only 10 microns in diameter. Uh, so now the binder is int intimately uh, involved with the uh, crystallites. And we want that to be uniform in size and spherical because this is how we're going to process it. We're going to press it. And when we press it, we want all that powder to flow very uniformly. Okay. Now, I mentioned before that, that, that we took one portion and milled it to a finer grain. Now, these materials now have exactly the same chemistry, but the one on the left-hand side, we'll look at the, at the x-ray first, we, the one on the left-hand side has dramatically higher translucency than the finer grain one. This is the coarse grain one on the left and the fine grain one on the right. So just by modifying the process, one, one extra little step to, to mill it, we've decreased the we've decreased the translucency of the material and we've, we've negatively impact the uh, quality. And here, here are the bridges made from those and with a, with a backlighting. And you can see that the, the large grain one is much better than the, so, than the fine grain one with regard to translucency. So my point now, and, and for the balance of this, uh, of my portion of the talk, is that the composition alone of zirconia does not determine how well the material is going to behave. It does not determine the overall strength, and it does not determine the overall translucency and, and how well the material can reproduce a, a, a shade. That is determined not only by the composition, but also by the processing. The processing is more critical with zirconia than it is with, with uh, uh, other uh, uh, prosthetic materials that we've used in the past. Now, that slurry can be handled in a variety of different ways. 
uh, hydrothermal, as I just mentioned. Uh, it means that it goes into water and we, we impact it with uh, basically just high temperature and that drives the chlorine off and the water off as well. Hydrolysis, uh, which can also be done where you take that same slurry and you uh, uh, pass a current through it and you can derive a, a certain quality of material from that. And again, this is very, very large batches. Or as you may, uh, uh, you, you may know, some early companies tried this sedimentation technique where they started with a slurry and they actually cast it into little, little discs right at that point. Uh, that process was, was done on the early zirconias. It's not done uh, very often anymore because it's, it's not very um, uh, conducive to the type of aesthetics that we're, that, that we're looking for uh, nowadays. Now, the actual dental zirconias are very, very simple. Uh, they involve uh, uh, zirconia, this other material called hafnia, and then yttria. Uh, hafnia is a benign sister material with zirconia. Uh, sometimes nature doesn't allow us to make things 100% pure, and that's the case here. So no matter what we do, we're always going to have some hafnia uh, in the material. It's a, it, it doesn't affect anything. It doesn't affect the strength. It doesn't affect the translucency. It, it just is a, is a sister material with zirconia, and, and it's there. Uh, because it's there in greater than 1%, uh, we report it. Uh, generally, uh, m most people will reduce it to less than 2%, uh, and, and, and that, that's a sufficient feedstock. The uh, uh, alumina content uh, is, as I listed here, uh, less than a quarter of a percent. You, you may remember the first zirconia, the zircon material was very opacous. It was very chalky white. And this is the reason why uh, the alumina in there was like a quarter percent. And it was there to prevent something that happens with zirconia and that's called aging. Uh, water can get in between the particles, the grains, which, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. Uh, water can get in between the grains and actually disintegrate the material. The, the, the material just falls apart. Uh, it was a problem with zirconia that, would, that was recognized in the orthopedic uh, application. Uh, the solution was to add alumina. The alumina sits in the grain boundaries and acts as a, as a little cork. The water can't transfer, can't transfer into the grain boundaries and therefore you prevent this uh, aging reaction. The problem is that the material is not very aesthetic at that level. You need to bake porcelain on top of it or press porcelain on top of it. And in order to get a monolithic material, some of the early ones had no alumina at all and risked the aging factor. But as time went on, we learned how to control the alumina content to improve the aging and not impact the uh, aesthetics. So the modern uh, uh, zirconias have like a 0.05% or even, even less. Uh, alumina in there. And that, that gives us the quality we want with regard to preventing the aging reaction, but yet it, it uh, doesn't impact the translucency. Now, this other element that we call yttria is there in order to stabilize the zirconia. And we'll talk more about that later. And generally uh, in the, the present day zirconias, it's in there between five and 10%. Now, as I mentioned, in order to modify zirconia, you really need to concentrate on the processing, which is very different than what we had with other prosthetic materials like alloys or porcelain, where if you wanted to change the thermal expansion of the alloy or the thermal expansion of the porcelain or the translucency of the porcelain or the firing temperature of the porcelain, you had to modify the composition. So we couldn't do much with regard to processing on alloys and we couldn't do much with regard to processing on porcelain. But we did have the controls with regard to the composition. With zirconia, for a variety of reasons, the only thing we could really control it, it, with regard to the composition is the yttria content. And as I said, that could vary between five and 10%, but it's the processing that determines what you're going to see when you open that box and, and look at the restoration that the laboratory sent you. It's the processing that determines whether that material is gonna be opacious, whether that's actually gonna look like an A2 uh, and, and how easy it is uh, for the laboratory to, to function, uh, to, to make a, a, fu a functional unit. Again, it's the processing. 
Now, everyone indicates, everyone advertises rather that, well, they have a 510K approval from the FDA. And that's, that's true. This is a class two product and it requires a, a clearance through 510K process. However, the standard that's used for zirconia is ISO 6872. And it, it is not a standard that's designed for zirconia. It's designed for any dental ceramic and it started life as the standard for dental porcelain. As a result, there are no compositional requirements. So the manufacturer does not have to provide to you, the dentist or to, to the laboratory, what is actually in the zirconia. They're, they have limited mechanical property requirements because again, the, the source was the original, like the luminous porcelains, which, which had very low strength. So they couldn't eliminate it, the material if, if they wanted a higher strength. So as a result, the class four, we have a three unit bridge has, has to have a rest, has to have a flexural strength of only 500 megapascals. And all of our zirconias that we recommend for three units or more have greater than 500 megapascals. We, we just can't tolerate that low a, a stress, uh, a stress level. And the same thing for class five. Uh, for class five, where we have four more units, and this can go to a 14 unit bridge, 800 megapascals doesn't cut it. 800 megapascals is barely enough in our estimation for a three unit restoration, okay? The other problem with the standard is that the radioactive test was made for uranium, but it doesn't include thorium. Now I showed you specifically that the zirconia sand has that thorium radioactivity in it, and it's in there in a significant quantity. But the reason why it doesn't address thorium is because again, when it was designed for dental porcelains, the uranium dioxide was used very long ago uh, as a fluorescing agent. Now that material was reduced, uh, was eliminated in the 70s, but still they, they kept this uh, uh, radioactive uh, concentration. So when you, have, when you have a material that can pass the FDA, can pass ISO and still doesn't doesn't have the, uh, the requirements that, that m most companies think is necessary for zirconia, you, you, have a big, you have a big problem because you just don't know. And, and it takes a, a, a someone in the laboratory to say, okay, fine, this is what we really need. We need a company that's going to support us. We need a company that's going to provide us with a material that goes well beyond what the standard requires. Now, you may have heard of something called the Y classification of zirconia. And all it stands for is the mole percent of vitria. Uh, the, uh, uh, any ceramic uh, is not like an alloy. It cannot be made to exactly the same composition every time. So the weight percent is always an approximate weight percent. So rather than use weight percent, uh, a ceramic engineer will use something called mole percent. And it's abbreviated into like a three Y. So something that has about five and a half percent yttria will can be considered a three percent by mole uh, a yttria material or a three Y material. And here are some of the examples. The uh, original materials in, in Argonne was called Ultra. You know about Zircon. Certainly you're, you're aware of uh, 3M lava. Uh, and then the uh, monolithic materials, uh, uh, Aesthetic, uh, Bruxer or Nexer. Um, uh, all those were, were three Y materials. And then the next thing that was introduced was a five Y material. And that comes down here. That's like the Bruxer anterior, uh, the Jensen, uh, 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 I forgot the name, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it had a uh, Zircon Zahn anterior, Bruxer anterior, Argon anterior. A lot, a lot of them had uh, that anterior under name. Jensen was the only one that didn't, and it slips my mind, I'm sorry. Uh, and then more recently, the multi-layer materials, like the katana materials, uh, or in Oregon, it's uh, STML. Uh, so the five Y materials were the next one to be introduced. And then Oregon introduced this, this one that's in between the two uh, called HT+. So they have three Y materials, four Y materials, and five Y materials. Um, so it's just a shortcut for describing how much yttria is in the material. Now the zirconia processing in the laboratory is straightforward. However, they have to be very careful in how they process their zirconia. For example, um, we say here, monitor the burr uses. Well, you, if you're making a long span bridge 
with zirconia, and and they they don't allow the for the uh, uh, for the change out of the tools, which by the way are, are really expensive, that don't allow for the change out of the tools. That long span bridge may not fit, and that's a problem, right? Because you have to redo the entire thing. So a little bit of care on the dental laboratory side is necessary for anything of, of the process. You have to calibrate the mill. They have to check the support size. You see the 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 units are held. To, are held uh, uh, to the uh, are machined out of the disc using a support structure. You can't you can't allow for the whole thing to just fall out. So you need to know how big that support structure is going to be. And again, there is nesting programs, but it takes uh, again a level of understanding in order to uh, do it right and do it right the first time. Uh, you see, there's a, obviously a, a degree of shrinkage. The the uh, manufacturer of the zirconia has to calculate what that shrinkage is. Uh, the standard allows us to go to two decimal places. Argon goes to four decimal places because on a long span bridge, it's important that third decimal place is important. And we feel for all on fours, the fourth decimal place, place is important. So we, we provide for uh, more than, again, what the standard requires to allow the laboratory to get it right again the first time. Okay. Uh, processing uh, is, is, again, another issue with regard to the glazes. Uh, glazes, low temperature glazes need to be used or else the material is going to crack. And of course, you don't want to open up that package and, and, and see a crack. Now, some of the properties of zirconia are really fantastic. Zirconia is inert. So that means it's very biocompatible. You're never, there's no chance of an adverse tissue reaction for the patient. If you, see, if you have a patient that has a little redness next to the, uh, uh, next to the margin, it's probably due to, uh, to the cement rather than, rather than the material. Uh, zirconia is very, is very biocompatible and extremely inert. Remember, it was used for uh, an or orthopedic application where, where, it go, where it went in directly into the body. But because it's so inert, we have problems with it with regard to what we're used to. It can't be etched like dental porcelain could be etched. Uh, the zirconia cracks can't be healed. If you had a little crack in, a, in the porcelain, and maybe when, when you made an adjustment, you could just put it back in the furnace and it would re, it would, the glass would flow and it would reheal. You can't do that with zirconia. There's no glass. The chips can't be repaired. Once it cracks, it's gone. Uh, it has very poor adherence with porcelain. And that was one of the main uh, reasons why the monolithic zirconia took off so fast because everyone was really tired of the chipping uh, of, the, of the porcelain uh, in vivo. Uh, and then bonding is very dependent on the technique. Uh, the, the material is, is, that's used is very, is very dependent, but also uh, right now it's very unreliable compared to what, what dental porcelain is or, or the lithium disilicates. Now also zirconia is a poor conductor of heat. So that's great for the patient because you're not gonna have any hot or cold sensitivity. But on the other hand, there's no indication of when the material is being overheated. So it's not gonna get warm in your hands. It's just gonna crack. Uh, any minor contouring or adjustments on center zirconia must be made with water, copious amounts of water. And the word copious, I can't underestimate. Uh, you're, you're hitting it with a, with a high-speed carbide. That water must be flowing in order to ensure that it doesn't fracture. Uh, hard tools like carbides or diamond discs can't be used on center zirconia. Now that's mostly in the, in the, in the laboratory because they concentrate the heat or the zirconia to transform, resulting in fractures. Now, hard uh, diamond discs are used in order to open the embrasures. And once, it, once the zirconia is centered, that's pretty much it. Nowadays, they have tools made for zirconia that are uh, diamond impregnated and, uh, and can open the embrasures because they're diamond impregnated rubber and they don't concentrate the heat and they'll still cut through the zirconia. So again, uh, the the property of zirconia that's very good does cause us some some issues uh, with with processing. Now it could look like dental porcelain. We have dental porcelain on the right and uh, zirconia on the left. But that's on the outside. On the inside it's extremely different. Uh, zirconia is a crystalline ceramic. As you can see here, it has grains, has grain boundaries just like an alloy does. A uh, dental porcelain is a glass, has no structure whatsoever. 
So these differences make a very big difference in how the material can be handled, both in the laboratory and in the operatory. Now, when you when you made an adjustment on on porcelain uh, on a PFM, for example, that was relatively easy. That's like that's like a knife going through butter. But you're trying to make an adjustment on zirconia, and what you're actually doing is making little chips off the material, because the material itself doesn't carve; it actually fractures. You see, here's a score on zirconia, and these little little radial cracks when they come to the surface, they chip off. And that's the little thing that, that you see flying off, or you may feel it flying off. If you see sparks, then you're witnessing the transformation of zirconia. And that unit may not be long for this world. So what are the troublesome features of a crystalline ceramic? Well, there's no tolerance for tensile forces. It will readily fracture under tensile. And I'll give you an example as to where the tensile forces come from in a minute. And there's no elasticity. It's not like a PFM. The units will not flex. Uh, sometimes when you have a when you, when when you have a situation where you want to when you want to seat it, uh, it, it'll it'll uh, PFM may, may flex and then and then seat itself again. Zirconia will just crack. It's very sensitive to any surface flaws and it cannot be healed. Uh, any crack in zirconia was just gonna continue to go. When the crack starts, it travels at the speed of sound. So our little units, our little small uh, thin wall units don't have a chance uh, to, to provide for any type of uh, stopping the crack, okay? Now, I, I spoke to you about tensile forces. Now, fortunately in the mouth, most of the forces that we have are compressive, but there is one situation where you have a tensile force and that's on the intaglia surface of a connector. So here, when this plantic goes into, into function, the intaglia surface goes into tension. Uh, for those of you that had used the Procera bridges, you know exactly what I'm talking about because that's where they always fail. They, uh, that requires that the laboratory change the design of the restoration from what we had in PFM to what we need for zirconia. So the bridge connectors have to be much larger than what you're used to in PFM, especially in the vertical dimension. Here, here's, a, here's a case of uh, not flexing. Uh, there, was a, there was a small uh, misjudgment during insertion and the wall just cracked away. Uh, now, if this was a PFM, it probably would have survived. Uh, because the metal would actually flex before the porcelain would crack. But in this case with zirconia, that doesn't happen. It just cracks. Okay. Now, one of the things that we need to be cognizant of is what the biting force is in the area of the mouth that we're working on. And every restoration obviously will have, will have a, a different concern. Uh, what we see are mostly fractures on the molars. And the, the reason for that is quite obvious. Here, uh, most molars have, uh, have to withstand a biting force of about 400 newtons. Now, how thick does that occlusal wall, th that occlusal uh, uh, surface have to be in order to tolerate 400 newtons? Well, it's a very simple calculation. So here, in order to withstand 400 newtons, if your zirconia has a strength of 1,250 megapascals, then the minimum thickness has to is just less than six tenths of a millimeter. If, however, the zirconia is at 850, then it has to be a little thicker at seven tenths. For most of the five wide materials, we're closer to 650, has to be eight tenths. And here, as a point of reference, you have Emax at a full millimeter because the, the strength of the material is so low. So there's a direct relationship between the strength of the material and your preparation. How, what, how thick that restoration is going to be is gonna determine how long it's gonna last. If you get a material that has a little higher strength, you're much better off, uh, then, th th then you, th it gives you more insurance, I should say. Most of the uh, three Y materials are about 1100 megapascals. Our HD plus is a little higher than that. So we can go a little, uh, uh, a little lower in, uh, in, in thickness. Okay. Now, again, molars are very susceptible to fracture because that occlusal fossa is a natural stress riser. 
And, and that needs to be rounded rather than pointed. So uh, uh, again, there's another factor that the laboratory has to take into consideration. And, uh, and, and you need to take into consideration with regard to preparation, because there should be, uh, uh, that's where you have to measure the thickness of the, uh, uh, to determine whether or not that restoration is gonna last. Now, zirconia is not indestructible, regardless of what uh, people may have said before. Uh, if, you get, if you get below those minimum values with the strength of zirconia you're using, as, as, you, as we have here, we have an occlusal thickness of under 5 tenths of a millimeter, and this material has a, has a strength of 1,100 megapascals, uh, it fractured, and it, it fractured very early um, uh, in, in, its, in its life. And again, it's strictly because the material just can't tolerate that amount of stress. So remember, uh, zirconia can't be designed, contoured, or adjusted like PFM restorations. Basically, that, that's, that's all I want you to remember out of this whole talk, okay? Here we have an instance where the molar was ground on without water and, uh, and the side chipped off. Another one where there was an undercut in the preparation, again, forcing the seeding just chipped the material off. And again, if this was a PFM restoration, it probably would have made it. Okay. So why does zirconia fracture? Well, I'm going to use an analogous system with like water. Water has three forms, okay? A high temperature form, we call it steam or gas. Uh, mid temperature, we call it is liquid, is water. And then the uh, solid form of water is ice. Zirconia also has three forms and they have funny names. The high temperature form is cubic zirconia. Uh, you may remember cubic zirconia from the jewelry store. It's a, it, it's a zirconia has, uh, cubic zirconia has the, uh, uh, only the second, uh, uh, second the diamond with regard to uh, uh, co color reflectance. Uh, then this middle form, this tetragonal form, this is the strong form of zirconia. This is what we want to, this is what we want to um, uh, keep. That's what we want in our dental one. But the material itself wants to go down to this lower temperature monoclinic form. So how do we prevent it from happening? Well, we add yttria to it. And adding yttria to the zirconia stabilizes that mid form, just like adding salt to water will prevent the water from freezing. And the uh, situation is quite analogous. But again, in this tetragonal form, the material has a lot of stress and strain. And any, any excuse for that material to release the stress, it will take. When it does transform, it increases in size, just like water will increase in size when you freeze the water in the refrigerator. Uh, in your freezer, the ice cube, well, the, uh, the ice cube is about 9% larger than the volume of water you started off with. I'm sorry, that's my dog. Uh, and uh, here in the, in, the, in the case of zirconia, uh, the tetragonal to monoclinic form going to, when it transforms will increase in about 7%. So it literally tears itself apart. There's just no way of stopping that crack from happening. So for crack prevention in the laboratory, we talk about centering, we talk about eliminating hard tools, we talk about design features, and we talk about preventing tensile stresses by using the proper connectors. Now, there's a variety of different zirconias on the market. The first ones that came out, as I mentioned, were 3Y. That's, that, that's in, our, in our case, that's aesthetic. But it has a strength of 1,100 megapascals and a, and a translucency of 40%. The next one that came out was a 5Y material. That had a much better translucency, but the strength was substantially lower. So we were looking for a material that would be able to uh, have a higher translucency, something between 40 and 50, but yet not lose the strength. And we were able to develop a product that we call HD plus, and this is a four Y material where the strength is actually higher than the three Y material, but the translucency is also higher. So not only can you use this for any type of restoration, 14 units, implant bridges, whatever, uh, but also you get a much better, uh, much better looking material. Uh, and then we use that same technology to improve the 5Y material. And we didn't, we didn't want to change the translucency. We wanted the translucency to remain the same. We didn't want it to get transparent. But we did increase the strength. 
and that's called our HTML. And uh, Dental Masters happens to be using both the HTML, HD Plus, and the uh, STML, uh, the multi-layer zirconia, and, and uh, Michael will talk to you about why. Uh, we're going to be coming out with a HD Plus multi-layer uh, uh, later this year. Okay, so we're going to see more types of zirconia being introduced, and we have to learn how to best use them. Okay, thank you for your attention. Your turn, Michael. Paul, thank you very much. Uh, I am just absolutely delighted with the breadth of coverage and that you accomplished that in, in 31 minutes, sir. Uh, my compliments to you. All the while, while you're spinning around the earth on the International Space Station, quite, quite the feat, sir. Um, I will point out to our attendees, and there are many still with us tonight all over the United States, that uh, if you have a quick question, for Dr. Cascone, uh, you can go ahead and use the chat room and we will be happy to uh, uh, respond. Uh, do you have a question from Dr. Arun Sharma? Good evening, Arun. The question for uh, Paul Cascone is why use three Y if four Y has higher strength? That's a very good question and I don't have an answer for you. We've been, we've been, we've been very successful with the HD plus for exactly that reason has a better translucency and a higher strength, you, you, don't, you don't need anything else. Paul, would you, would you argue to an extent that the current international classifications for dental ceramics really aren't appropriate for zirconia? And moreover, would you potentially argue that the Y classifications uh, really are losing their relevancy with regard to what Argent has accomplished in their materials? Yes, exactly. Uh, number one, uh, just for processing from a ceramic standpoint, uh, you just can't look at the at the amount of yttria and know that the material how the material is going to behave. There are three Y materials that only have uh, one thousand megapascals, and why use that at all? That doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, but yet they're there, uh, and and that's one of the that's one of the factors that we're working on in order to uh, bring everyone up. Uh, to, uh, uh, to where not only where we are, but also other companies uh, feel the same way. It's the processing of zirconia that makes a difference, not necessarily just looking at the, uh, at the yttria content. Dr. Sherman, thank you for that question. Let me see. Uh, we do have another uh, question that came up, which is how best to adjust zirconia in the dental clinic setting if required. Paul, do you have a comment on that? With, with a lot of water, that's it, fine, uh, a fine burr and, and a lot of water. But you should talk to Michael about how you want it to begin with, so this way you don't have to adjust. Well, you know, certainly uh, the objective is to, have to, to not have to adjust contacts and occlusion. That can occur, uh, no matter how accurate the laboratory is. And you know, the, your point is well taken, a copious irrigation as well as using the appropriate instruments uh, so as to not create stress fractures in the material. Paul, I think you would concur with that. Yes, most definitely, yes. Paul, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to pick up the ball and run with it. Uh, we're now at uh, 644 and, and uh, I'm a, a Vince Lombardi fan. Uh, Vince uh, had one of his expressions was, uh, if you're um, on time, if you're early, you're on time. And if you're on time, you're late. And we, we would certainly like to, to finish on time here. So, uh, but we do, uh, I don't in any way want to constrain our audience for joining us tonight. If you have questions at any time, Paul is going to be monitoring the, the chat section as well as the Q&A area. So please feel free to, uh, to chime in at any time. Uh, again, I'm Mike Kolick. I'm the, the founder of Dental Masters Laboratory. I've been in dentistry literally all my life, uh, 41 years full-time. I'm a second generation technician uh, and dental entrepreneur. Proud to say that my dad, uh, who left us this year on March 3rd at the age of 95, he started us in the field of dental technology, delivering packages for a dental lab in the 1930s in Chicago, Illinois, and, and became a, a lab owner in 1950, following his service in the United States Navy in World War II as a, as a dental technician and then a pharmacist mate. So, our roots in dentistry are, are very deep. 
Uh, I want to give thanks to uh, Drs. Gordon and Rella Christensen. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be an evaluator uh, with CR for a good number of years, although as a laboratory technician, there really isn't much that, that comes across our desk uh, from a clinical perspective. Nonetheless, Dr. Christensen and, and Dr. Rella are incredible resources for laboratories as well as clinicians. And uh, I think they, along with uh, the, the breadth of literature that's available to laboratories today, I, I, I hope that more of my colleagues are really taking a close look starting with Dr. Christensen at, at the, the range of, of information that is provided in particular by CE and other publications, particularly on the prosthetic side, the JPD uh, material research publications as, as well. We are in a new era of dental technology. I will make that point. I believe we're going from dental technicians to dental technical engineers. And that means that uh, people like myself and my colleagues in the laboratory need to really uh, have an appropriate level of understanding, not only the fundamentals of dental technology, but also now we need to be much more knowledgeable relating to both material science as well as the world of CAD CAM. So thanks again to Drs. Christensen. Uh, they've been on the world of zirconia since their first publication and mention of it in June of 2010. And uh, their most recent publication was the CR report in September of this year. So much of what I will reference uh, in summary goes back to points they've made. Uh, they made five points for steps to, uh, to sex with zirconia. Uh, I have six. Number one uh, relates to uh, proper prep and impressioning. Now this is true really for just about anything we do in dentistry, but particularly true for uh, glass ceramics and oxide ceramics, meaning zirconia. Uh, we would really like to see the following whenever possible. Uh, four millimeter axial height, millimeter and a half occlusal reduction. We want a half a millimeter to three quarters of a millimeter axial wall taper. And we certainly don't want that tooth to be over tapered. Uh, we'll lose retention and resistance for them. We want a slight chamfer, and we do want you to provide as possible uh, occlusal anatomy to give us a appropriate thickness along the central fossa, the central dissectional groove of the tooth. You can see the the inadequate preparation to the right. And uh, if we get below that half a millimeter mark in the central fossa, that will uh, lead to fracture as we saw uh, so well pointed out by Dr. Cascone. If we look at impressioning, uh, points are very clear there. Uh, double gore technique is still considered to be the gold standard. Digital impressions uh, with proper reflection uh, are proving to be extremely reliable. And uh, we're, we're big fans of digital impressioning in our laboratory. Uh, it certainly has made our life easier on a day in and day out basis for a number of reasons, ultimately leading to uh, fewer remakes. Uh, what is the perfect prep? Well, that's a term that I came up with about 10 years ago. And thanks to one of our, our longtime clients and a good colleague and friend, Dr. Wayne Sutton, we did a video. It's now about 10 years old, but it still applies. It's the reverse preparation technique. Uh, we call it the perfect prep. And that uh, video is still available on YouTube. Just on YouTube, search perfect prep. Uh, the kit that we recommend is the reverse preparation kit uh, that allows you to cut uh, axial and occlusal depth cuts and then to finish off the restoration with the remaining burrs that you see on the left. This particular technique has been around for a long time. Um, from what I understand, not as well known as, as perhaps some others, but um, I am told that it is straightforward and in most instances, uh, relatively easy to follow. Uh, you can see here how the axial depth cups are done, how the football shaped diamond is used on both the occlusal table as well as ultimately later relating to the gingival margin. And uh, this technique does allow for a, a very nice preparation uh, without guesswork and a minimization of trauma uh, to both hard and soft tissue. So we have the reverse preparation kit. Uh, actually, we do sell this at Dental Masters on our e-commerce site. And uh, there is also a separate depth kit available, also sold by Kerr and available from us. The reverse kit does not include the one millimeter depth cut whereas the uh, actual reduction kit does include it. 
These also can uh, be ordered separately uh, from distribution from Henry Schein or Patterson. Um, and again, if you'd like to see a, a, this particular technique in action on video, just go to YouTube and enter and search the perfect prep bird kit. Step number two, uh, proper zirconia internal surface treatment. As uh, Dr. Cascone pointed out, zirconia cannot be etched using hydrofluoric or phosphoric acid. Actually, the use of phosphoric is only going to create a problem. A, uh, both of these will inhibit the zirconia cement bond. Uh, they're literally going to act to, to seal off the surface and render it inert. So what do we want to do? We want to uh, sandblast the surface, uh, the internal, followed by a thorough rinse. The step number three, we want to properly decontaminate the restoration after trying. That means that we want to remove saliva from the internal surfaces of the crown. We want to we recommend the use of flower pumice for best results. Preppies Plus by Whitmix is a, a good option. Uh, do not use Profi paste to clean up the prep. The emollients, the oils in the Profi paste will act to contaminate the preparation surface. On the internal, and this has been a, a, an area that has led to early on, I think, maybe not so much today, uh, a lot of debonding of restorations, uh, particularly when used with uh, resin cements. The, the phospholipids uh, that come onto the tooth need, upon a try and they need to be removed. And uh, if you didn't sandblast upon initial try-in, now's a good time to sandblast again, or you can use the Ibuclane uh, from Ibuclar Vibodent with a very thorough post rinse, as much as 60 seconds. Uh, I will say in reviewing the literature that the sandblasting is going to achieve about 30 megapascals uh, in immediate bond strength relative to about 45 megapascals of, of bond strength. Uh, by virtue of using the ibuclane. So you're gonna get a superior bond by virtue of proper use of the ibuclane. There are other materials on the market that will act to do the same as the ibuclane material itself does. What we have is a, a zirconia oxide in solution, in solution of sufficient quantity that in essence, it's pulling the, the phospholipids off of the surface of the internal of the zirconium oxide. It literally acts like a sponge. You can see here tensile bond strength uh, where the abiclene's been used. Obviously, phosphoric acid is contraindicated and uh, uh, water is, is insufficient. Number four, proper use of, uh, of a primer. Uh, do not use a silane only primer. Uh, as a reminder, uh, this is not a glass ceramic. It's, it's an oxide. Use a primer with MDP to enhance resin bond. There are number of primers on the market now that contain MDP, which is metha dihydrogen phosphate. I won't pronounce all the letters that, that follow the word, uh, the first word in that uh, chemical definition, but Z prime, clear fill, ceramic, monobond plus, these all have MDP. You do have the option of uh, using a universal bonding adhesive uh, containing MDP. Uh, the Cura clear fill universal bond quick has received some very positive reviews. Uh, I will point out, if you go to Dr. Christensen's clinician's report assessments uh, of zirconia, if you query uh, on a subscribed basis on any of these products, you'll get detailed information with regard to how they were rated by uh, clinical, clinical research associates. Step number five. Step number five is the proper use of cement. We, in essence, have two choices here. We have the resin modified glass ionomers. The indication is a retentive prep that is greater than or equal to four millimeters in axial height. Uh, the resin RMGI cement bond to zirconia is enhanced by two things, by proper decontamination following try-in and the use of an MDP primer slash adhesive on the internal. That's uh, noted in uh, CR in October of 2018. So these are examples of RMGIs. Uh, about 70% uh, of the market, according to CR, is using RMGIs for the retention of their zirconia units day in and day out. Uh, it is the most reliable long-term bond to tooth structure among all cement types and, and has the added benefit of fluoride release. Uh, Self-adhesive indications, what do we have when it comes to zirconia? Well, 
the number one indication would be a short non-retentive prep, assuming we have an adequate uh, uh, size for a appropriate ferrule, when we're under four millimeters of axial height, or we're in the anterior, um, or we're facing heavy opposing, opposing occlusion. Perhaps you have a patient who's refusing to wear a mouth guard at night. These are also indications for the use of resin cement. So some examples here is the Reliax, Maxim, SpeedSem Plus, and, and a number of others that have various degrees of rating and success depending on whose literature you are considering. Now, I, I have number six. Uh, I go one farther. I think sometimes it's best to consider not only what to do, but also what not to do. You know, when should we not be thinking about zirconia? Well, certainly when we know that we're not going to be able to have a, a restoration that is, is going to be more than six tenths uh, on the occlusal. Uh, and correspondingly, we're gonna have inadequate wall thickness. Uh, in my view, the, the answer uh, would be typically a milled gold crown. Yes, I use the word milled. Uh, we don't cast gold crowns anymore, we mill them. Uh, there's documented studies uh, underlining the fact that a milled gold crown is in essence a, a zero porosity crown. and uh, done properly by both the mill process and the laboratory uh, will lead to superior marginal closure. Those are pluses relative to the use of cast gold. Uh, zirconia opposing zirconia in extremely active, heavy occlusion. Um, if we do not use this, we're gonna avoid the microscopic breakdown that has been known to occur in this instance. When the opposing contact is cast gold or polymer, a polymer to the zirconia. This will help avoid extreme wear. Consider using the same material again, which would be gold over gold. Uh, obviously where precision attachments are indicated, we want to uh, go with a PFM. And this last opinion, I have a bit of a challenge agreeing with. W where the highest level aesthetics is or are a priority. I believe this opinion is going to change over the next two to five years, perhaps some of you tonight will already agree with you that we're already at a point where what we can do with zirconia is rivaling lithium disilicate ceramics. And you'll see that in just a moment. What high strength zirconias do we use at Dental Masters? Well, we use the Argin HT Plus. Uh, we market it under the name of Pronto. Why Pronto? Because we make it in, in literally only three days. We have the amongst the fastest lab times in the United States, the, the amount of time it takes for us to process, uh, because our laboratory is able to, to operate 24 seven, it, it, it is not a five or seven or 10 day process. Uh, we, our work is all made here uh, in the United States. There's no reason to ship things off to another country and then wait 10 days for it to come back. So we use the HT plus, you'll see it's a 45% translucency. It's a four Y classification. I'm very much looking forward to the multi-layer that uh, the folks at Argen uh, have coming out, hopefully the beginning of next year. 1,250 megapascals, this is a very strong zirconia that allows us to use it for uh, everything from a full arch down to a small bridge, down to a single first or second molar. So I love the application of this material. And I do wanna point out, I looked at every zirconia on the market uh, over the last 10 years, uh, including uh, Katana and Ivoclar. With all due respect to those companies, uh, Ivoclar right now, pardon me, Argent right now, uh, really is the company that's best meeting our needs. Uh, what aesthetic zirconia are we using? Well, it's the Argent ST multi-layer. They're super translucent dental zirconia. We can use this for full contour up to three units. I will tell you from a, um, a practical experience, the Katana material is a wonderful material, but in from in my hands and my perspective, it tended to have a little bit of a zebra stripe look to it. We see a much better blending from gingival to incisal with this material uh, right out of the, uh, the centering oven. It has a 50% translucency and uh, it is classified as a, 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 as a 5Y. 850 megapascals, literally double the strength of Emacs. Um, I liken it to Emacs on steroids. So Pronto Aesthetic, again, the Argent Z uh, super translucent multi-layer, 850 megapascals, 50% translucency. 
So what is the state of the art as, as I get to the end of our, of our time together this evening? What is the state of the art with these rest, uh, restoration materials? Zirconia, lithium, disilicate, PFM, what's really one of the, the best ways for me to just give you my perspective in a relatively short number of moments? I thought really the best thing for me to do would be literally to show you these materials side by side in a shootout. So if I had not put the name up here indicating that these are zirconia restorations and had left the name off, I think some tonight might have looked at, looked at these and said, wow, are those Emacs? Um, these restorations have no external stain. Uh, they, the gradation of color, the dentin uh, to enamel translucency are all inherent in the material itself. So I am very impressed with what we can do combining the anterior material, the multi-layer from Argen, uh, with the high strength posterior, pronto aesthetic and pronto full strength. But let's take a look at this. This is the uh, competitor to Emacs. It's the GC Lisi lithium silicate, lithium disilicate. It's different than Emacs in that the microcrystals for this material fill the entire glass matrix that leads to um, a better degree of vitality, a better light refraction. And, and in addition, uh, according to what was published by Nihei in 2017 in IJDR, this material has better mechanical properties and better chemical stability than two other lithium disilicates compared in the study, which were the Ibaclar and the Shofu lithium disilicate, disilicate materials. So um, I encourage you, if you've not tried Lisi, uh, whether it's with us or another laboratory, uh, please uh, ask about it, try it. PFMs, there's still a place for PFMs. Uh, these PFMs are not hand stacked. They have been, uh, put onto a uh, selective laser melt substructure, SLM printed by our colleagues at Argent, to which we have done a wax overlay, a milled wax overlay that we have then pressed, like we can press Emacs, Empress, uh, Lisi. These are pressed to metal restorations. Uh, I was talking to Dr. Kiscone earlier about the difficulty of, of getting numbers as to the fracture resistance uh, for pressing metal to ceramics. Uh, and Ian, I'll be talking more about that, I hope, tomorrow. But the, I can tell you this, while I don't have any numbers to give you, I can tell you that in practical experience, the fracture resistance of a, hand, of a pressed material, whether it's to zirconia uh, or to metal, well, we know it's stronger when it's pressed to, to, to zirconia, particularly with the uh, Norotaki material, the CZR. And I have to assume that, we're, that we can prove the same thing when it comes to pressing uh, a PFM. So here we see all three uh, together as a group. Uh, and I think in dentistry, does the saying beauties in the eye of the beholder, does that ring true? Well, I think yes and no. Uh, I mean, ultimately it's the clinician's choice along with the acceptance of the patient. What I do wanna underline here is we can see the um, vitality that is inherent to the zirconias that we're using now. If we go back to 2009, when Bruxer first came out, we literally have, have gone, to me, light years in, in progress with our, our aesthetics uh, and now the reliability of these materials, assuming we're following the outlines that were covered by Dr. Cascone and, uh, and myself tonight. There's some fundamentals there. If they're properly followed, I think we can expect a great deal of success. We know from uh, CRA uh, that the percent of failure on zirconia in their studies is zero. Uh, Emacs is at 94%. So six steps of zirconia, that's what I wanted to share with you. I have one other bonus point, and uh, this, is, this is one that uh, comes really uh, out of sincerity. You know, why do your colleagues choose our laboratory? Uh, we protect peace of mind, and we focus on increasing the success of uh, our clinician clients. We've been in business for 70 years and our whole philosophy is based on consistent success from people you trust. So I encourage you to and invite you, we would be honored to be of service to you during this era of COVID when the challenges that we're facing uh, seem to not be getting lesser. 
Uh, I'm happy to share with you that uh, we just introduced a recovery reward, uh, which is a $15,000 in total rebates toward an intraoral scanner purchase. So if you've not purchased an intraoral scanner, I think now is a, is a great time to consider it. Uh, if your cash flow permits, I know many of you are not as busy as you would like, but whether it's now or later, uh, we're big believers in, it, in intraoral scanning. You can see the pricing that we offer and the turnaround time that we offer on Zirconia is extraordinarily difficult for, for many labs to beat. And uh, we're proud that we've been able to generate the, both the quality and the efficiencies uh, in our American Sacramento, California Dental Laboratory. So on that note, uh, if you would like to step forward in success with us at Dental Masters, last promotional statement here. Please text this to this number, 888-288-7279. If you would like our catalog and fees email, just text catalog. If you would like our starter kit, we'll send it to you via UPS. Just text the word kit. And if you'd like to have a chat with me, I'd be delighted to, to speak with you at your convenience. Just text uh, the word call to 888-280-7279. Paul, do we have any questions that uh, we would like to address before we end the evening here? I see one question yes, from Dr. Dr. Welk. Yes, uh, Dr. Welk, as an endodontist, he uh, wants to know what is the, what do we recommend for restoring an endodontic access using a composite to maximize the seal on a zirconia crown? Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? With regard to endo access? Yes. Well, uh, you know, certainly when we're talking about the HT plus, uh, I mean, it, it has in my mind, the uh, mechanical material properties of a three Y. And the three Ys have been proven uh, and endorsed for endo access without great fear of, of fracture. I think when we get into the 850s and below, uh, the, the chance of fracture goes up uh, proportionately. And I think in those instances, it's a matter of just beware that you may see failure. Yeah. The, um, uh, in, in addition, I would say that the, uh, uh, the composite material that it should be a dual cure composite in order to ensure that the seal is, uh, is going to be, is going to last. That, that would be the, from a material standpoint, that would be the one thing that I would, I would recommend. The other question was, do you place monobond on the tooth uh, or in the crown? And the answer is uh, in the crown. Yeah. And with regard to uh, Medit, yes, we do. We are a Medit link laboratory. And uh, you, uh, if I see uh, it's Dr. Cassell that's uh, asked that question, we'll be happy to, to send you the necessary information uh, tomorrow following this program. Any other questions? We answered everything. Paul uh, and, and everyone who's, who's joined us this evening, thank you so much uh, for being with us. If you have a uh, comment uh, for us relating to other programs that you'd like to see us do with our colleagues at, at Arjun or, or other partners in the uh, dental profession, please let us know. You can text that same number uh, with any thoughts or ideas that you have. Uh, on that note, everyone uh, have a pleasant evening. Thank you, be safe and uh, pleasant holidays ahead. We'll see you again down the road. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Paul. Have a good Have evening. Have a great night. All right, bye-bye.